Hi, I'm Ms. Tessa Parker from Johnson High School, and I'm an art teacher, and I'm here to talk to you today about how to use color to create shadows in your art. First, we need to go over some basic essential questions. What is form? How can we create shadows without using the color black? And how did artists during the Impressionist art movement use color to create form and shadows? Some people know about the word form and some people don't. Some students that come to high school still don't know what form means. Form is basically the three-dimensional shape. So you can see here in this picture of the pear that there is a shadow and the pear looks 3D. It's not a flat two-dimensional drawing. So how did the artist make it look three-dimensional? If you were using graphite or pencil, the shadows typically show different values of black. So values is all the different levels from lightness to darkness. And here we're talking about the color black or the shadow of black, and that's because this artist would have used graphite. So using different values of black can create a three-dimensional shape, and the three-dimensional shape is also known as the form of the object. But Typically, when you use black, it tends to make things look flat. So I want to teach you how to use color to create form and shadows so that your objects still don't look flat and lifeless. The Impressionist painters, uh, this was around the time period of the 1890s and a little bit earlier, decided um, that they wanted their paintings to have more color and be more lifelike and not be so dark. The reason they came to this decision is because they started to go outside and paint what we call plain air. And plain air is when you are painting in the outdoor area in plain sight of what you're seeing. Um, plain air is a French term, so P-L-E-I-N-A-I-R. Uh, this is a painting you might recognize by Claude Monet called The Water Lily Pond. Uh, it was painted in 1899. And Monet um, actually built a pond outside of his house um, just so that he would have water reflection and lily pads and the greenery to paint. So this was in the later years of his life. Um, he painted a lot before then, but the last um, years of his life, he did, I think, over 200 paintings just from um, inspiration from this water lily pond. As you can tell on the bridge, you see a lot of blues and greens, and in the background, you see a lot of greens and even some dark purpley blues in the trees. But if you look at the water, you'll notice that there's a lot going on. There's reflections, there's lily pads, there's lily pad flowers, um, lotus flowers, there's grasses on the side. But do you see other colors there? You don't see a typical blue like what you would think water would look like. So we know that water is a reflection of whatever else is around. So you can see a reflection in the water of the trees behind and a reflection of the marsh grasses in the water. So how did they figure out how to paint like this, using so much color? Do you see any black in this painting? There's really not any black. So what the Impressionist artists realized when they went outside and they were trying to capture the impression of whatever the scene was and the way the light was reflecting on uh, the objects around them, they realized that there really wasn't that much black in nature. So how were they to create the shadows uh, without using the color black. And what they decided was, they went back to the color wheel, and they realized that if they use the color that's complementary, that they could change the intensity of the color and make it look more natural, and they could also do something else. They could put the complementary color right next to the color, and that would make the color more vivid and lifelike, then giving the impression that you were outside looking at it in that natural light. Now, a lot of artists also use just cool colors for shadows, like blues, blue violets, blue greens, and greens. And they would use the warmer colors for the lighter areas. Um, but this particular lesson that I want to teach you is just focusing on using the complementary color for the shadow. So do you know what the complementary color is? Let's look at this color wheel. You can see there are a lot more colors on there than just the primary colors. Do you remember what the primary colors are? because a lot of students come to high school and they might only know the primary and the secondary colors. So let's review. The primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. You can see them on this color wheel. 
So the primary colors basically come from pure pigments that we can find um, around the earth in different locations, and that's how we can make those colors. So red can come from iron ore, um, blue can come from indigo, uh, yellow comes from ochre, and then those combinations of those colors can make your secondary colors, and then the third set of colors, the ones that have the hyphenated colors, come next. So you would make orange by mixing red and yellow, you would make violet by mixing red and blue, you would make green by mixing yellow and blue. And then you can see that the, the last set of colors that all have the double colored name, like red-violet with the hyphen in between, comes from mixing a primary color and a secondary color. So if I took the primary color red and the secondary color violet and I mixed them together, I would get red-violet. So any way you do this with the complementary colors to create the shadows, you're going to refer back to this color wheel. So if I was to create for example, a red apple, and I wanted to use a color for a shadow on the red apple, I could go directly across the color wheel, and I would find green. So red, the complement to red is green. It goes directly across the color wheel. Do you know what the complementary color is to yellow? If we look directly across from yellow, we'll find violet. So violet and yellow are complementary colors. Red and green are complementary colors. How about orange? Maybe I wanted to paint a picture of an orange. What would be the complementary color that I would mix into the orange to make the shadow? Or I could put it directly um, at the bottom of the orange. Look straight across from orange and you see blue. So orange and blue are the complementary colors sets there. Now you can also do this with the tertiary colors. So if you have red orange, the complementary color to red orange would be blue green. What about red violet? the complementary color to red violet would be yellow green. Okay, so now do we understand how you can find the complementary colors on the color wheel? Great, let's move on. So this was the painting we were looking at before. Now let's locate on this painting where we can find complementary colors that Monet used. Here's a close up of the lily pads. I see a lot of green lily pads and I see a lot of lotus flowers. The lily pads are green but there's another color mixed into the green. Do you see the red? The little bits of red, and it almost looks like a shadow. So Monet put the red in there with the green to make certain areas look darker. And it's not just that he put them side by side. A lot of times, he would actually mix them together. Does this make the image look more lifelike? I think it does. If you could imagine if Monet had used black instead of red, then the, the green tones would have looked really flat and dull. Okay, so using the complementary color is a great way to create shadows without your colors looking flat or dull. Okay, so just to recap, we have learned about form, we've learned about complementary colors and how to use the complementary color for shadow, and we've learned about the color wheel, and we've learned about impressionist painters. So now I'm gonna do a demonstration to show you. All right, so I have here two pairs. They're kind of a yellowy green color, but we're going to imagine that they're kind of yellow, because in my, this is a bluish light looking underneath here, but if they're a yellowy kind of color, yellowy green, um, the color directly across from the color wheel would have some purple to it. So let's take a look at the shadow. If I just set this right here, do you see how this shadow side has a little bit more purple to it? And this side has a little bit more yellow to it. Okay, so we're gonna do a drawing of the pair and we're gonna color it and then we're going to add those two colors and I'm gonna show you how to mix them. The other thing that a lot of impressionist painters um, discovered was that on white surfaces, like if you look at a painting, an impressionist painting of the snow, then the white snow usually has like a bluish cast in the shadow areas. So for this example, we'll probably use some blues for our shadows on this white piece of paper. Now, I know a lot of students don't have um, you know, specialized art products at home, so this is just white copy paper that I'm working on, and I'm gonna be using colored pencils, so nothing too fancy, okay? Uh, the reason that I chose the pair for our demonstration today is because 
uh, a lot of students, they get kind of worried about, you know, drawing something and making it look absolutely perfect. And so if I tell them to draw an apple or a banana, then they feel like it doesn't look quite right. But a pear is nice because it's so bumpy and it's just a very odd, unusual shape. And no two pears look exactly the same. So I feel like you'll be more comfortable drawing a pear. So go find some paper and a pencil and let's start a sketch of the pear. All right, are you ready? So to start with, the pear has kind of a round bottom. And I like to lightly sketch first, like this. This is called a gesture sketch. So you're lightly drawing. And then I'm gonna look at the top of the pear. This is almost like a circle, but not complete. And then I can go up. Okay, this is the shape of my pear. And then I have a stem. Notice my pear is not perfect, doesn't matter. It's all lumpy and bumpy anyway. And now I can go back and erase certain parts that I wasn't quite happy with. I always tell my students to draw lightly in the beginning because you're gonna to wanna to go back and erase maybe. Okay, that's a pretty good pair. All right, now we're gonna add some color. So I am just using some colored pencils. This is my personal set from home that I brought in today. Um, I like to use Prismacolor pencils, but if you don't have um, nice colored pencils at home, then you can use crayons, would work wonderful for this um, lesson because crayons have a nice waxy, um, they're made out, made out of a nice waxy material, and so they, they um, mix and overlap really well. This would not be very easy to do with markers, so I would not suggest doing this lesson with markers. Okay, so I have kind of two different colors of yellow here. One's very warm, one's very cool. So I think I will try the warmer color and see how that looks. Another thing, oh, it's pretty bright. Another thing to think about when you're coloring and when you're adding shadow is to color in the direction of the object. So I wouldn't just color this straight up and down. I need to do it in a rounded motion so that my object looks rounded. And I think I'm also going to leave some spots white so it looks like a shine on the pear. Okay, and then this side I'm gonna go a lot darker. Notice it does not look like a shadow yet. It just looks like different values of yellow, some light and some dark. I would encourage you to color yours in a little bit better than what I'm doing, but I'm kind of moving a little bit quicker because I want to show you this in paint as well. Okay. Now, this is a little bit messy here. I'm going to clean that up. Okay, so I've got my basic pair. I have the light, I have medium values, and I have yellow values. Um, our pairs that we were looking at had a little bit of green in them, so we could add a little green as well if we wanted to, just very lightly so that it looks kind of more like the pear that we were looking at. I'm gonna take you back to the Google Slides presentation that I was looking at a minute ago with the color wheel because I want you to see what would be the complementary color to yellow green? Okay. All right, so there's my pair. We go back to the color wheel 
and we look at yellow green, we see directly across from it is a red violet. So we're gonna use a little bit of violet, but maybe a reddish violet. So that would be kind of more of a purpley pink color. Okay, so let's see what we have here. Okay, this is a nice violet. Let's see how this looks. I like that a lot. All right, now let's look back at the pear. Do you see the purple color here on the left side? All right, so that's what we're working on right now. And we are mixing the colors directly on top of each other. Blending them together. This pear is beginning to take shape. It now has form. It looks three-dimensional. It still looks lifelike. And I bet you thought purple on a pear would not be a great idea, but how do you feel about it now? Now, one of the things that um, I mentioned maybe earlier was when I was doing the yellow, was I was talking about coloring in the yellow darker. So how do you use colored pencil to so color some areas in darker versus lighter? It depends on the amount of pressure that you push down with, with the pencil. So here you can see I'm kind of putting more pencil and I might be bearing down a little harder and that will give me a darker value. And then as I move away from that area, I can do just lighter very light amount of pressure with the pencil, and it'll just kind of lightly color the pear. Okay, where, from where I'm looking, the pear looks really nice. All right, I've got some nice purple shadows, um, some yellowy green colors, and even some light areas here. I probably could use a little bit more shadow in this area. Oh, that's a different pencil. Okay, what about that stem? The stem also has kind of a golden color to it, but we could probably use a very light brown since that's what it looks like. Let's see if I have a light brown. I do have a light brown, but it is not sharpened, so give me just a minute to sharpen my pencil. This is actually more of a medium brown, so here I can color in a lot darker. And then I can and push down harder to get a darker color, and then I can lift up a little bit lighter to make it a lighter value. Okay. Now, we cannot forget about the shadow that's to the left of the pair, the one that was cast on the table. And I told you earlier that impressionist painters would have used a certain color like on snow. Do you remember what it was? It was blue. So let's find a blue color pencil and let's try to add a little bit of shadow with blue. Um, one of the other things that's important is that we're working on a very flat surface. So to make your shadow look flat, then you would color from side to side, not up and down or at an angle necessarily. Um, if you were coloring um, a, a rounded object, then you would color in the rounded direction. Um, or a bumpy object, then you might do it in all different directions. But because this is a flat surface, we're going to co color it kind of flat. Uh, what shape was the shadow? That was another thing we needed to think about for a second. So let's take a look. Here is the pear. It's hard to see, but it's kind of rounded here, like this. Okay, so let's go back to our pear. Okay, and then I'm going to color it from side to side. Now the pear might cast a little bit of its color on the white reflection uh, on the white surface. It might reflect some of its color. So you could mix in some of that purple shadow in with this blue, and that would be really lovely. You could also put some yellow in there too. 
um, because the white would have some of that reflection of the color on there. So let's do a little bit of that as well. You can make it, make it most dark right up next to your object. This, and then kind of, as you come away, it can come a little bit lighter. All right, let's try putting that violet in there, mixing the colors, and then we can also try a little bit of the yellow. Okay, I'm blending them all together. Okay, so that is our drawing of a pair using the color for the complementary color to create the shadow and the form of the object. We used no black in this drawing, and you can tell that the pair looks very realistic and lifelike. Um, now, if I have a little bit more time, I want to show you how to do this with paint because um, using colored pencils is very different. You have a hard time mixing on the surface. I'm just going to quickly sketch the pair again. Okay, just a basic sketch. Now, the mixing of colors is one of my favorite things. Um, when I'm mixing my own paint and in the classroom, I always have my students use um, recycled things for the mixing of the paint. So we like to put our paint on paint lids like this. Uh, because then after the, uh, this is acrylic paint, by the way, that we're using um, for this demonstration. After we use the acrylic paint and it dries, um, we can do something really nice for the environment, which is that we can just peel the paint right off of the plastic and we can throw it in the trash instead of washing it down the sink. I always tell my students it's bad to wash the paint down the sink um, because all of the water eventually goes out to the, the soup, well, through the sewage treatments and then eventually to the ocean. So we do not want to put much paint down the sink. All right, so we have a plastic lid, and I have a couple of colors here. I have yellow and violet. I have some white, and I have a little bit of brown, just in case I need it. This is called raw sienna. This is cadmium yellow. So I'm going to put a little bit of yellow. The reason I especially want to show you this is because if you were to paint a pair with yellow, it might look like a neon yellow pair. And that is not exactly what you're probably going for. So how do you change the intensity of the color of the yellow to make it look more realistic? And that is the exact same thing I was just teaching you a minute ago with the complementary color. So to make the color more realistic and lifelike, you're going to change the intensity of the color. All right, so let me get a paintbrush. A water cup. All right, let me just get a little bit of white and brown just in case I need it. So first things first is we're going to play with our palette. This is the palette where we mix the paint. And we're going to do some color mixing right here. And we're going to experiment with changing the lightness of the yellow to get a more realistic yellow. Do you see how that looks like neon yellow? Let me put it on the paper so you can see. Is that what you want your pair to look like? Probably not. So let's try putting a little bit. We'll move it over here. Let's try to put a little brown in there. That's a little bit more of a realistic color. But let's try it one other way. Let's try the yellow over here. Put a little bit of white in it, make it lighter. And let's try a teeny little bit of purple. That is also a more realistic yellow, just like the pair that, you, that I was holding a minute ago. Okay, so let's take this color. We're gonna mix up a little bit more of it now that we know that's what we want. So we're gonna take the yellow and put a little bit of white into it. 
Okay, this is a less intense yellow, a little bit more natural yellow. And now that I have the color, I can go back and get a little bit more water from my water cup. My, uh, my water cup. And with acrylic paints, you can paint in different layers of thin paint. So then I'll take this color and I'll start right here on the, the medium side. With painting, you also paint in the direction. Think about the form of the object. Let's add a little bit of white over here on the side. Okay. This is a very nice color for a pair. I like this way better than using straight yellow out of the tube. Okay. All right, now let's make a darker version of this color. I'm gonna wash the white off my brush and I'm going to mix a little bit more purple into my yellow. The good thing about acrylic paint is that if you don't like it, it's okay because you can always paint right on top of it. My students always come to me and say, I think I ruined this. And I'll say, well, let it dry and then you can put more paint on top. No worries. So let's try this color, see how it's gonna look. We can test it. Oh, I like it. Okay, here we go. It's a little bit dark. All right, though. Now I can go back and get more of that yellow. And I can even use what's left over on my palette and just kind of work it in there. Maybe add a little bit more of the white back in. And there's an in-between of the two. This is actually called wet on wet. So you're working, this side's wet, this side is wet, and the part in between is wet. So you can kind of do some blending while everything is wet. You can kind of smear them into each other. Now the pear has like lumps and bumps, so you could even go back and add some texture. All right, that's a pretty good looking pear. Now, how about the stem? We could use the same color that we just created, because remember the yellow and the violet mixed together made that nice kind of brownish color, so we could use that same brown for the stem. Not a great brush for the stem, but it's okay. Yeah, it's too big, oh well. All right, how about the shadow? Let's see. Shadow color is gonna be a little bit more bluish, so I need to get some blue. Okay, this is, I've just pulled out an ultramarine blue. Let's see how this looks. Why don't we try mixing this blue into the color we created earlier to see if that's a nice reflection on that white surface. There we go. A little bit more of a natural color there. So then I can create my shadow color with this. If you were using watercolors, you might want a little bit more blue. We can add a little bit more blue into it. Okay. Now, if you really wanted even more shadow on the pair, you could even come back in directly with the violet. Maybe with the violet mixed with just a little bit of the yellow and that would be, that would be a nice little extra texture Go back in and darken it even more. Sometimes I even just take my finger and kind of rub it like this. Just fine. All right, well, that's about all the time we have today for using complementary colors. 
with um, creating shadow and form. And I hope you enjoyed learning this lesson about how the Impressionists learned about using complementary colors to create more lifelike and realistic colors, things that you, less intensity you know, in your color, um, colors that might have actually exist in nature, um, and how to not use black and instead use color for shadow. And again, my name is Tessa Parker uh, from Johnson High School.